The Indonesian island of Flores is home to an ancient legend. It tells of an elf-like creature with oversized feet, an awkward gait, and a voracious appetite. Villagers call her Abu Gogo, the grandmother who eats anything. She seems as mythical as all the other tiny beings found in fairy tales and big Hollywood films. Creatures like leprechauns, elves, and hobbits. But is she? Were the storytellers of Flores inventing or reporting? The first evidence of what might be a new human ancestor came to light in the 1990s. While searching for fossils, a team of Dutch and Indonesian scientists uncovered puzzling artifacts. These rocks may look ordinary, but to a trained eye, their sharp edges stand out. They are handcrafted, and so old, modern humans could not have made them. I was certainly a skeptic to begin with. Were they really stone tools? Were they in the deposits they were said to be in? Were they dated to the right time? Archaeologist Mike Morwood was asked to examine the tools. There were indications that they were at least 700,000 years old. So that started off my first association with Florence. Tools this ancient should not exist on Flores. For millions of years, it's been cut off from the Asian mainland by the Wallace Line, a biogeographical barrier formed by deep ocean trenches. For eons, the line's treacherous currents have barred most animals from crossing over and kept those who did so isolated that evolution worked some remarkable changes. One that survives today is the carnivorous, poisonous Komodo dragon. At 10 feet long and 300 pounds, it's the world's heaviest lizard. As for seafaring modern humans, there is no evidence they reached Flores until about 12,000 years ago. So who made the mysterious stone tools three quarters of a million years old? To figure out the identity of the ancient toolmakers, Morwood and his colleagues needed more evidence. Their search took them to a limestone cave on Flores called Liangbua. In the local language, the name means cold cave. With its cathedral ceiling, it has long provided a refuge from the tropical heat and rain. My first impression was that this is the best archaeological prospect I have ever seen in my 30-year career. The explorers hoped the cave's sediments built up over millennia would contain secrets from the distant past. But before the dig could begin, the team needed to figure out how to prevent the walls from caving in. So myself and others went on a, a grave digging course in Sydney to learn how to safely shore up soft sandy deposits. And we needed that for Indonesia because we're going now 16, 17 metres underground. You need to make sure that things that are dropping in, coming in on your head aren't going to actually, it's not going to happen, otherwise you'll end up dead. So everything has to be properly shored up if you're going to go down to these sorts of depths. And nobody had done that in Indonesia. For two years they dug deep pits removing tons of sediment, sifting every bucket load, looking for the ancient toolmakers. Then, about 20 feet down, they discovered a tiny arm bone. Our bone identification person was just totally puzzled by it. It was that different. A single bone, very unusual and very small. We didn't know what to make of it. 
Another year of exhaustive digging yielded little else except a single, possibly human, tooth. With money running out, Morwood briefly left his Indonesian colleagues, Thomas Sutikna and Rakas Awedui, digging at the site. A couple of days later, I phoned them up and Thomas said, very excitedly, we have the skeleton of a pre-modern individual. It had no forehead, it had significant brow ridges, it didn't have a chin and so on. An apparently pre-human skeleton was a tantalizing find. Its small size and shape suggested a female child. But Raka soon discovered wisdom teeth, exposed and worn. This skeleton was not a child, but a miniature adult. If she was human, she was one of the smallest adults ever found, barely three feet tall. Struck by her size, the team classified her as a new species, Homo floresiensis. They labeled her skeleton LB1 for Liangbua, but it was the name of a fictional character that stuck, the Hobbit. And she was not alone. The team also found fragments of 12 others, equally tiny, including a complete lower jaw. Surrounding them were stone tools, charcoal, and the butchered bones of pygmy elephants, suggesting incredibly that these tiny creatures hunted and used fire. This was something completely out of the sky, it seemed to land straight in our hole. But it was, it was genuine, it was real, and now we've got to deal with it. To explain these puzzling discoveries, Morewood turned to Peter Brown, an expert in paleoanthropology. The Hobbit took him by surprise. Within 60 seconds, I realized his lower jaw was totally outside the range of modern human variation. There's no way it could have been a modern human. It was very, very clear cut. The most perplexing feature of the Hobbit was its tiny brain, smaller than a chimpanzee's. When I first measured the brain volume of Homo three senses, my colleagues reported that I went into a sweat, got very, very flushed, and was obviously flabbergasted. So I remeasured it, remeasured it, remeasured it. it. Just didn't make any sense. The Hobbit brain is dwarfed by modern humans. Around 400 cubic centimeters, it's less than one third the size. Although her skeleton was surrounded by tools, she seemed to be a throwback to a primitive ancestor. If it is what it seems to be, it's an extremely primitive human-like form. It has a brain the size of a chimpanzee, yet associated apparently with stone tools, living in a place where we never knew primitive humans got to. So altogether very challenging find. To make sense of the discovery, the team needed to know how long ago the Hobbit had lived. Bert Roberts set out to date the sediment layers surrounding the ancient fossils. My speciality is luminescence dating. That's where we actually look at when the sediments were last exposed to sunlight and entered the cave. And that's great because then you can work out the burial age of the individuals. So straight away we started working on the sediments surrounding LB1. And we came up with a date of less than 30,000 years, which is very surprising. If Roberts was right, the hobbits lived recently enough to have coexisted with modern humans. That surprising result opened up the possibility of using another method, radiocarbon dating, to fix the age of the bones even more precisely. 